Chapter 27 A Fence First of all, I said, first of all, everything, of course, must be enclosed by a fence. Otherwise, when they start bringing in building materials to construct the manor house, somebody could come along and pilfer them. And when you plant a crop, it might be stolen before you harvest it. Or are you against fences on principle? I'm not against them, Vladimir. Even animals mark out their own territory. Only what are you going to make the fence of? What do you mean, what of? Fence boards, of course. No, wait. Fence boards can turn out to be on the expensive side. For starters, you need to dig post holes and string up barbed wire all around the property. Even then, you should still put up boards so people wouldn't see inside the fence. And how many years could a board fence last without needing repair? If it is constructed of good material, if you keep it painted or varnished and smear the parts of the posts that are in the ground with pitch, it might go five years or more without needing repair. And then? Then you'd probably need to do some repair work and touch it up to keep it from rotting. So that means you will constantly have to fuss over the fence, and it will give your children and grandchildren e even greater cause for concern. Would it not be better to construct it so your children will not have to bother about it? And so that their view will not be spoiled by the sight of a rotting timber? Let us think of how to make a fence more solid and long-lasting so that your descendants may have fonder remembrances of you. Of course, you can build it so it will last longer. Who wouldn't want that? For example, you could make brick pillars and a brick foundation and put cast iron grill work in between. That kind of fence doesn't rust. It can even last a hundred years. But only very rich people can afford to build a fence like that. Can you imagine a whole hectare? That's a perimeter of 400 meters. A fence like that is going to set you back several hundred thousand rubles, maybe even millions. Still, it'll last a good hundred years, maybe 200 or more. You can even have it made with all sorts of family monograms. Your descendants will look at it and remember their great-grandfather and it will be the envy of everyone around. Envy is not a good feeling, Vladimir. In fact, it is harmful. Well, there's not much you can do about that. I tell you, enclosing a hectare of land with a good fence is not something many people can afford. That means we must think up some other kind of fence. What other kind? Can you suggest something? Would it not be better, Vladimir, in place of a whole lot of posts which can later rot, to plant trees? Trees? And, and then, what, nail boards? Why nail boards to them? Look here in the forest. There are a lot of trees growing with their trunks only one and one half to, to two meters apart. Yes, you're right. But there are holes between them. It's not yet the same as a fence. But it is possible to plant bushes in between them that people can, cannot get through. Take a careful look and think what a splendid living fence you would have. And it would be just a little bit different with each person. And everyone would come to admire the view. And your descendants in the ages to come will remember the creator of this splendid hedge. And the hedge will not only save them time on repairs, but bring them benefits as well. It will serve, in fact, as far more than just a barrier. One person will make a hedge out of birches growing in a row. Another will use oak. And someone with a creative impulse will make a colored hedge, the kind one reads about in fairy tales. What do you mean colored? Planting, tree, planting different colored trees. Birches, maples, oaks, and cedars. Someone may intertwine a rowan tree with a cluster of bright red berries and still plant gilder roses in between and make room for a bird cherry tree for bird cherry trees and lilac bushes. After all, you can plan it all out in advance. Each planter should watch to see how high each one grows, how it blooms in the spring, what kind of fragrance it has, and what feathered friends it attracts. Thus your hedge will be both sonor sonorous and pleasantly fragrant, and you will never get tired of looking at it, as the picture will be changing its tints with each passing day. 
It will flourish with colors anew every spring, and every autumn burst forth in an explosion of fiery hues. Well, Anastasia, it seems you're a poetess as well. We began with just a simple fence, and now see what you've made of it? You know, I really like the way you've turned the whole thing around. And why haven't people thought of this before? No painting required, no repair. And when the trees get too big, they can be cut down and used for firewood, and people can plant new trees. They can change the picture, just like an artist. The only thing is, it won't it take it a long won't it take a long time to plant that kind of a hedge? And if you're going to plant the trees for a meter, two meters apart, then you've got to dig two hundred holes for the saplings, and then plant the bushes in between. And no technology will be allowed, you'll say. On the contrary, Vladimir, there is no sense in rejecting technology for the project at hand. Indeed, any invention of the dark forces must be put to use to serve the forces of light. It will hasten the implementation of the plan if you use a plow to dig a trench around the perimeter of the ground lot and plant the saplings in it, along with the seed at the same time. For the bushes, you have decided to plant between the trees. Then you can go over it again with the plow to fill in the soil. While the earth is still loose, you can adjust the position of each sapling to even out the row. That's fantastic. So in two or three days, one person can put a whole hedge. Yes. The only drawback is that until the hedge grows, it won't deter any thieves. And people will have to wait a long time for it to grow, especially in the case of oak and cedar. But birch and aspen grow quickly, and the bushes between them will not take much time either. If you are in a hurry, you can plant the tree saplings two meters high right away. When the birches are grown, they can be cut up for household use, and their places will be taken by the maturing cedar and oak trees. Okay, then, a living fence is something I can grasp. I, I really like it. Now tell me, what style of houses do you see on the ground lot? Perhaps we should first plan out the lot as a whole, Vladimir. What do you have in mind? Different beds for tomatoes, potatoes, cucumbers? That's usually women's work. House building is a man's job. I think you need to build one large house right off, a fashionable manor house in the European style so that your grandchildren and great-grandchildren rem will remember you fondly. Then there can be a smaller cottage for the servants. It's a pretty big lot, after all. It'll require a lot of work. Vladimir, if everything is done properly from the start, there will be no need for servants. Everything around you will serve you with great pleasure and with love. And not only you, but your children and whole family and your grandchildren, too. It doesn't happen that way with anyone, even your beloved Dachniks. They only have five or six hundred square meters, and yet they're working it every free day from dawn till dusk. And here they're going to have a whole hectare. It's going to take at least a dozen dump trucks every year to bring in the fertilizer and manure. First, the loads of manure have to be spread out, spread over the whole growing area. And then all the earth has to be dug up and turned over. Otherwise, nothing will grow right. And you'd better add some kind of fertilizer. You can get it in special stores. If you don't fertilize, the soil won't give any good, won't give a good yield. It's something agronomists, people who study agriculture, know, and Dotchniks have learned from experience. I hope you agree on the need for fertilizer. Of course, the earth needs fertilizing, but the task need not be devitalizing. God has thought through everything in advance so that the ground and place you wish to live will turn out to have the right nutrients and be in an ideal condition without wearisome physical efforts on your part. You need only make contact with his thought and feel the wholeness of the system he has designed, instead of just relying on your own intellect and making decisions. Then why is nothing fertilized today, anywhere on the earth, according to God's system? Vladimir, right now, you are in the taiga. Look around you. How high the trees are, how mighty their trunks. Among the tree, trees, herbs and bushes are growing. There are raspberries and currants. 
Indeed, a whole lot of everything grows right here in the taiga for man's use. And over thousands of years, not a single person has fertilized the ground. But the land remains fruitful. What do you think? How has it been fertilized, and by whom? By whom? I don't know. How or by whom? But you've pointed out a really important fact. Indeed, it's simply amazing how man somehow gets everything twisted around. Tell me yourself, why aren't various kinds of fertilizer n needed in the taiga? Here in the taiga, God's thought and God's plan are not interfered with to the same degree as where man lives today. In the taiga, leaves fall from the trees, and little branches are torn off by the breeze. And these leaves and branches, along with worms, fertilize the ground in the taiga. And the grass, which grows all around, regulates the composition of the earth. The bushes help it clear away excesses of acids and alkalis. None of the fertilizers you are familiar with can substitute for leaves falling from the trees. After all, leaves include many of the diverse energies of the universe. They have seen the stars and the sun and the moon, and not only seen, but they have interacted with them. And even many thousands of years from now, the ground here in the taiga will still be fertile. But the ground lot where our house is to be built is not the taiga, you see. Then start planting. You yourself can plant a forest of different kinds of trees. Anastasia, maybe it'd be best if you told me right off how to make it so that the soil on the plot stays fertilized all on its own. That is a major undertaking since there are so many other things to do. Planting beds, warding off various kinds of, plant, of pests. Of course, we could talk about details and particulars, but it would be best for each one to apply his own thought his soul and his dream to the building work. Each of us knows instinctively what will be the most suitable arrangement for him and bring joy to his children and grandchildren. There can be no one single plan that fits all. Each plan is individual, like a great artist's masterpiece. Each man must make it his own. But give me an example, at least tell me in general terms. All right, look. I shall do a little outlining for you. But first, there is the most important thing to understand. Everything is created by God's hand for the good of man. You are a man and can control everything around you. You are a man. Try to comprehend and feel through your soul what constitutes a real paradise on earth. Now, more specifically, Anastasia, without philosophizing, tell me what to plant and where. Tell me where I should dig, what crops I should grow, and what will bring me the biggest return on my investment. Vladimir, do you know why peasants and farmers today are so unhappy? Well, no, why? So many of them are striving to bring in as big a harvest as they can to sell. They think more about money than about the land. They themselves do not believe they can be happy in their own family nest. They think the rest of the people are happy in the big cities. Believe me, Vladimir, whatever is created in your soul will unfailingly be reflected in the whole world around you. Of course, outward details are also necessary. Let us think together about one way we can plan out our plot. I shall simply start things rolling, and you help me on your part. Okay, I'll help. You start. Let's say our lot is on a barren section of land and is now enclosed on all sides by a hedge. Let us divide it, reserving half or three quarters of the lot for a forest, and there plant a variety of trees. On the edge of the forest, where it borders the remaining part of the lot, we shall plant a hedge in such a way that animals cannot pass through it and trample the crops growing in the garden plot. In the forest, we shall set up a pen using densely planted saplings, which in time will be home to a goat or two. And we shall use saplings to construct a shelter for egg-laying hens. In the garden plot, we shall make a pond approximately 16 meters across. We shall plant raspberry and currant bushes among the trees in the forest and wild strawberries around the edge. Later, after the trees in the forest have grown a little, we can set up two or three empty log hives there for bees. 
and we shall use trees to make a gazebo where you will have a cool place safe from the heat to talk with your children or your friends. And we can make a summer sleeping area out of living things, along with a creative workshop for you. And sleeping places for the children, and a living room. Wow, it won't be a forest we end up with, but more of a palace. Only the palace will be a living entity and continue to grow in perpetuity. This is how the Creator Himself thought up the whole balance of things. And all man has to do is to assign everything its task, according to his own taste, design, and understanding. But why didn't the Creator do it all this way to begin with? Everything in the forest grows just where it happens to end up. Think of the forest as a book for you as a Creator. Look more closely, Vladimir. Everything therein has been written by the Father. Look over there. Three trees are growing just a half meter apart. You are free to plant them in a row and use a whole lot of them to make up other configurations. In among the trees there are bushes growing. Think of how you can make use of them to sweeten your life. And where the trees do not allow grasses and bushes to grow between them, you can take that as a lesson for building your future house out of living materials. It is as though all you have to do is to formulate the required program and adjust it according to your taste. Everything around you is charged with the task of cherishing and delighting you and your children, cherishing and feeding them. To feed ourselves, we'll need to plant a vegetable garden, and that will take a lot of sweat. Believe me, Vladimir, even the vegetable garden can be set up so that it will not be an aggravation. You just need to keep everything under observation. Among the herbs, just the way everything grows in the forest, you could have the most splendid tomatoes and cucumbers under cultivation. Their taste will be much more appealing and healthful for the body than when they are grown simply on a patch of bare ground. But what about the weeds? And won't they be destroyed by pests and beetles? There's nothing useless in nature, Vladimir. And there are no purposeless weeds. Neither are there any beetles that are harmful to man. What do you mean? There aren't any harmful beetles? Take locusts, for example, or the Colorado beetle, a real vermin that eats away at potato crops in the field. Yes, it does. It is also thereby showing people how their ignorance is eating away at the self-sufficiency of the earth, contradicting the designs of the Divine Creator. How can people keep stubbornly plowing year after year in one and the same place, torturing the ground? It is like scraping an open wound, and at the same time demanding benefits from the wound. Locusts, or the Colorado beetle, will not touch ground lot where you and I have outlined. When everything grows together in one grand harmony, the fruits accruing to the owner are also harmonious. But if that's the way everything is going to ultimately turn out, meaning that on the lot you have thought up there is no need for man to fertilize the ground or fight off vermin with various kinds of poisons or do weeding, and everything is just going to grow all by itself, then what is there left for man to do? Live in paradise, the way God wanted us to. Anyone who is able to build himself a paradise like that will come into contact with the divine thought and produce a new co-creation together with him. What new co-creation? Its term, its turn will come once the creation of paradise has been completed in due course. Let us consider now what you and I still need to do. Chapter 28 Home We still have to build ourselves a decent home, I observed. A place for our children and grandchildren to live, problem-free. A two-story brick manor house with a toilet, bathroom, and hot water heater. You can do that for any private home these days. I was at a building fair recently and noticed how a lot of different facilities have been developing for conveniences in our private homes. Or are you again going to object that we don't need to use any technological gadgets? On the contrary, they are necessary. You need to make everything serve the cause of good as the opportunity presents itself. 
Besides, it is important that there be a smooth transition in people's habits. Only your grandchildren will not need the kind of home you are building. They will understand on their own as they grow up. They will need another kind of home. That is why it is not worthwhile spending too much effort to make the house extremely big or solid. Anastasia, I can tell you've got another slide trick up your sleeve. You keep rejecting everything I propose, even the house. I think there is no question, but it should be a decent house. You said we would be designing this project together. And here you're thwarting me at every turn, no matter what I say. Of course we are doing it together, Vladimir. Besides, I am not rejecting anything. I am simply expressing my views. And each one must decide for himself what comes closest to his own taste. You should have told me a little more about your views right off. I don't think anyone's going to understand why the house should not stay the way it is for the grandchildren. The other home will still preserve their love for you and their everlasting memories of you. When your grandchildren grow up, they will understand which materials out of all the ones thought up on the earth will be the most pleasant, solid, and useful for them. Right now, you do not have those kinds of materials. Your grandchildren will build a wooden house using those trees which their grandfather planted way back when, and which their father and mother so loved. That home will start curing them. It will keep them from impurities and inspire them to what is bright. The grand energy of love will dwell in that home. Yes, interesting, a home made of materials of the trees cultivated by their grandfather and their father and mother. And you say it will help protect those living in the home? How? There's some kind of mysticism involved here? Why would you call the bright energy of love mysticism, Vladimir? Because not everything's clear to me. Here, I've been talking about designing a home and a ground lot, and now you've all of a sudden started stating things about love. But why all of a sudden? You have to create everything with love right from the start. What, the living fens too? And do you have, a, have to plant the saplings in the forest with love too? Of course, the grand energy of love and all the planets in creation will help you lead a full life, in a, a life inherent in a son of God. Now you've really started talking incomprehensibly, Anastasia. From a house and a garden, you've gone back to God again. What relation could there possibly be here? Forgive me for not being clear in my explanation, Vladimir. Allow me to try a different route in trying to explain the significance of our project. Go ahead. Only it turns out that it's your project, not ours. It belongs to everyone, Vladimir. Many people will sense it intuitively in their hearts, but man will be prevented from grasping its specific details by fly-by-night dogmas, sounds of the technocratic way of doing things, and many scientific disciplines that are attempting to lead people away from happiness. All the more reason for you to try putting everything in more specific terms. All right, I shall try. Oh, how I wish I, my explanations could be clearer to people. Oh, how I wish they could. Oh, logic of divine inspirations, help me choose phrases and word combinations that will be more clearly understood. Chapter 29. The Energy of Love The great energy of love is sent to the earth by God for his children. It comes to each of them at one time or another. It frequently tries to cheer man with its warmth and stay near him forever. But most people do not give the great divine energy the opportunity of remaining with them for long. Imagine a couple where he and she meet at one point in the resplendent radiance of love. They endeavor to join their lives together in perpetuity. They consider that their union will be made more solid if affirmed on paper by ritual in front of a large gathering of witnesses but all to no avail. It takes but a few days for the energy of love to fade from their lives, and it happens that way with just about everyone. Yes, you are right, Anastasia. A tremendous number of people get divorced, about 70%. And it often happens that those who don't get divorced end up living like a dog and cat together, or show complete indifference to each other. 
Everybody knows this, but nobody can figure out why it happens on such a massive scale. You claim the energy of love fades from their lives, but why? As though it were somehow aiming to tease everyone or playing some kind of game it's invented. Love does not tease anyone, and it does not play games. It tries to stay with everyone forever, but man chooses his own way of life. And this way of life frightens the energy of love. Love cannot give inspiration to annihilation. It is unseemly for the offspring of love to live in torment when he and she are beginning to build a new life together, when they are endeavoring to establish a home in an apartment resembling a vault of lifeless stone, when each, one, each has their own work and interests and their own environment, when there is no common vision of the future, no conjugal aspirations, when their bodies are attracted by mere fleshly alleviation only to hand over their children to the cruel way of a world devoid of clean water, a world filled with bandits, wars, and disease, it is from this that the energy of love flees. But what if he and she have lots of money? Or the parents give the newlyweds, instead of a tiny flat, say a six-room apartment in a fancy modern block? with a guard on duty at the entrance, and they give them a fine car and deposit lots of money into their bank account. Would the energy of love agree to remain under those conditions? Could he and she live their whole life in love? Then they will be obliged to live their lives to the end of their years in cold fear, deprived of love and freedom, and watch everything around them grow old and rot. So what exactly does this finical energy of love require? Love is not finicky or obstinate. It aspires to the divine creation. It can forever warm the heart of one who agrees to co-create with it the, a space of love. And is there a space of love somewhere in the design you have come up with? Yes. And where is it? It is in everything. First, it is born for the couple, then again for their children, and through three planes of being the children will have a connection with the whole universe. Imagine, Vladimir, that he and she will begin in their love to implement this design that you and I are outlining. They will plant family trees and herbs in the ground, together with an orchard. And how happy they will be in the spring when their co-creations burst forth into bloom. Love will eternally dwell between them, in their hearts, all around. And each will see the other in a spring flower, remembering how they planted a flowering tree together, and the taste of the raspberries will remind them of the taste of love, since in the autumn he and she, in love for each other, touched the twig of a raspberry bush. In the shady orchard, splendid fruit is ripening on every tree thereof, and the orchard was planted jointly by he and she. They planted the orchard in love. She laughed resoundingly when he dug a hole and perspiration covered his brow, and she wiped it off with her hand and planted a kiss on his burning lips. It often happens in life that only one of the partners is in love while their mate simply tolerates the other's presence. Once they start working on the orchard, the energy of love will multiply itself and never forsake either of them. After all, their way of life will help them both live their lives in love and convey the space of love to their children in continuation, and help them raise their children together with God in His image and likeness. Anastasia, tell me in greater detail about the raising of children. A desire to know more about this is something many readers in their letters have expressed. Even if you don't have a system of your own, at least tell us, out of the existing system, which is best. Chapter 30 In His Image and Likeness You will not find a single system of child raising that will suit everyone, Vladimir if only because each one must first respond to the question of exactly what kind of individual they want to raise their child to be. What do you mean, what kind? A man, of course, a happy, intelligent man. If so, then the parents themselves must become that kind of man. And if they themselves have not been able to achieve happiness, then they should know 
what has prevented them from doing so. I very much want to speak about happy children. Raising them, Vladimir, means also raising yourself. The project we have been outlining all together will help in this. You and everyone else know the way children are born these days. People do not pay enough attention to their whole experience leading up to the birth, and many children are deprived of the planes of being inherent only in man, and so children are inevitably born cripples. Cripples? Do you mean without arms or legs, or polio victims? A man may be born crippled not only in outward appearance. Sometimes the body may appear externally quite healthy. But man has a second self, and each man should have a full set of all forms of energy, intellect, feelings, thought, and much else besides. But more than half of all children, even by today's very low standards, are deemed by your medical professionals to be deficient. If you want proof of this, take a look and see how many schools there are today for the mentally retarded. That's how your medical professionals classify them. Only they are comparing their abilities with those of children considered relatively normal. But if the doctors saw what the mind and the inner complexes of human energy could be in the ideal, only a few uh, rare individuals among all the children born on the earth would be considered normal. But why are all children not completely perfect, as you say? The technocratic world aims to prevent the three most important points in newly born children from merging into one. Technocracy tries to break man's link with the divine mind, and the links are broken before the child is born. And in looking for this connection, man goes searching the world in suffering and does not find it. What most important points are you talking about? What's this about links with the mind? I don't get any of it. Vladimir, in a great many aspects, man is formed even before his entrance into the world and his upbringing should come into contact with all creation. What God has used in creating his splendid creation should not be neglected by his Son. Parents should impart to their co-creation the three most important points, the three primary planes of being. Here is the first point of man's birth. It is called parental thought. Both the Bible and the Quran talk about it. In the beginning was the Word. Though it could be put more precisely, in the beginning was the thought. Let anyone calling themselves a parent today remember when they conceived their child in thought, and what kind of child they thought of him as. What kind of life did they foresee for him? What kind of world did they prepare for their creation? I think, Anastasia, that very few would even care to think of anything like that before the woman actually gets pregnant. In other words, they simply sleep together, sometimes without even being married. And they get married when the girl gets pregnant, since there's no way of knowing whether she'll get pregnant at all. And there's no sense in thinking about it ahead of time, when there's no guarantee she'll even have a baby. Yes, unfortunately that is the way it often happens. Most people are conceived in fleshy indulgence, but man, the image and likeness of God, should not come into the world as the result of fleshy indulgence. Now picture a different scenario. He and she build their splendid living home in love for one another and in thoughts of their future co-creation. And they visualize how their son or daughter will be happy in that place, how their offspring will hear its first sounds, its mother's breathing and the singing of the birds, God's creations. Then they will visualize how their children, when he, when, how their child, when he grows up, will want to rest in his parents' garden after a hard day's journey and sit in the shade of a cedar tree, in the shade of a tree planted in love for him by his parents' hands, with thoughts of him in their native land. The planting of the family tree on the part of the future parents will define this first point, and this point in turn will call upon the planets to aid them in their future co-creation. It is vital, it is important, and above all else it belongs to God. It is confirmation that you will be creating in His likeness, in the likeness of Him, the Grand Creator, and He will rejoice in the conscious awareness of His son and daughter. Thought is the origin of everything. 
Please believe me, Vladimir. The currents of all the diverse energies of the universe will unite in that spot where the thoughts of two have emerged, have merged in, into one in love where two together are contemplating a splendid creation. The second point, or rather yet another human plane, will be born and light a new star in the heavens when two bodies merge into one, merge in love and with thoughts of a splendid creation, in the very place where you build your paradise home, your living home for your future child. Then the wife who has conceived should live in that spot for nine months, and it is best of all if these months are the blossoming of spring, the sweet fragrance of summer and the fruits of autumn, where nothing will distract her except for joy and pleasant feelings, where the wife in whom a co-creation is already dwelling splendidly is surrounded only by the sounds of divine creations, she lives there and feels with her whole self the whole universe. And the future mother should see the stars and mentally give all the stars and all the planets to her splendid child as a gift. Something the mother can do all with the greatest of ease, something completely within her power. And everything will follow the mother's thought without hesitation. And the universe will be a faithful servant to the splendid creation these two people have produced in love. And a third point, a new plane of being should come about in that space. Right there on the spot where the conception occurred, the birth should take place, and the father should stay close around, and the great all-loving father will raise over the three of them a crown. Wow, Anast I don't know why, Anastasia, but I find your words even took my breath away. You know, I was able to visualize the spot you're talking about, and oh, how I could visualize it. It made me feel as though I wanted to be born again myself in such a place, so that right this moment I could go and rest in a splendid garden planted by my father and mother, so that I could sit in the shade of a tree planted for me before my birth, the place where I was conceived and where I was born, where my mother walked in the garden thinking about me even before I came into the world. Such a place would greet you with great joy, Vladimir. If your body should fall ill, it would heal the body. If your soul, it would heal the soul too. And if you were weary, it would give you food and drink. It would embrace you in a gentle sleep and wake you with a joyful dawn. But as with most of the people living on the earth today, you do not have such a spot. You do not have a native land a motherland, where the planes of being can merge into one. But why does everything we do turn out so lousy? And why do mothers continue to bring semi-retarded children into the world? Who took this spot away from me? Who has taken it away from everyone else? Vladimir, perhaps you yourself can say who failed to create such a place for your daughter, Paulina? What? You're not suggesting I'm to blame for... For my daughter not having a spot? 